Welcome to our quarterly virtual speaker series, Fall Brainstorm. The series is sponsored by the Kessler Foundation as part of our TBI Model System Grant, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Before I introduce today's presenter, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items. First, there will be a question and answer period after the presentation. I'll go over the format of our presentation uh, after uh, for our question and answer period. Secondly, we're gonna mute everyone during the presentation so we don't have any background noise. It's now my pleasure to introduce Glenn Bott, who will be presenting today, fall down seven times, get up eight. Glenn Bott, a vibrant and enthusiastic lover of life, had his life forever changed when he was struck head on by an SUV while bicycling after work. In a coma for over 10 days, he lingered between life and death. Once Glenn emerged from his coma, he spent months in a rehabilitation hospital where he had to relearn to walk, talk, swallow, and think. His training and beliefs prior to the collision helped him fully recover, surprising his doctors and therapists. These thoughts and beliefs along with his love of life saved him. He'll share with you why he survived an ER diagnosis of he won't likely survive, and if he does, he'll have very high odds of being severely brain injured and require assistance for the remainder of his life. We welcome Glenn as he recounts his healing process and engage you with moving stories of how his strong sense of self and awesome wife assisted him in not only surviving, but coming out the other side and improved version, Glenn Bot 2.0. Thank you, Glenn, for being here with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Fellow attendees, today's talk, fall down seven times, get up eight. I came up with this name because that sums up my training in my life prior to the TBI. So what I want to do today is recount a little bit of what happened and then share with you some tools and techniques that can help you improve and move forward in your life. This all started, and the screen's black, so don't, nothing went wrong. This all started back in 04, day after the summer solstice, and I like bicycling. My wife had a little store. I call it a, a chick store. It was home furnishings, jewelry, everything the ladies like for around the house. I was a loan officer for a mortgage company. My wife was going on a shopping trip for the store the next day. I got done a little early, so I called her and said, hey, sweetie, I'm going to go for a bike ride, and then we'll hook up for dinner. And she said, perfect, I'll be home, we'll do it. So I got home, changed into my bike and gear, and headed out. My wife comes home about an hour and a half, two hours later, no Glennie. She doesn't think a lot of it because I've had flat tires before. So she continues going about her day, finishes her packing for a trip, getting things ready, saying hi to the dogs. And then a little longer time goes on, still no Glennie. Darkness is falling. Now she's getting more concerned. She calls her brother who lives out where I used to ride a lot on this trail. And she says, hey, have you seen Glenn? And they go, no, I haven't seen or heard from him. And you gotta remember, this is back in the day before we all were had a cell phone glued to our hips. So they couldn't call me, I didn't have it with me. So they, they break up and go out and do a search around this little trail I ride. No Glennie, no sign, no bike, nothing, no one's seen me. At this point, they decide, call the cops, report a missing person. So they call in, the re receptionist takes the call and says, hold on a minute, what was he wearing? My wife said, well, he had a purple bike and a, uh, he always wears a yellow bandana. And I, I wear a bandana because I sweat a lot. And the receptionist says, hold on a sec. Comes back and says, someone matching that description was taken to the local hospital you need to get their ASAP. Whoa, this was not the, what they were expecting. 
they all pile into the car, head out. I'm sure some speeding was involved. She walks into the emergency room, you know, and she, she's looking around, you know, where is he, where is he, what's going on? And the re receive, re receptionist takes her back to the doctor. First thing the doctor says is, you know, come here, we want you to identify him. This is what she saw. She identified it. Yep, that's him. So the doctor explains, I've had a serious and severe traumatic brain injury. I was hit head on by an SUV right at the start of my bike ride. This all happened a couple blocks from home. The doctor explained that because of my age and the severity of the injury, extremely low odds that the lifestyle we had before would continue. He said very high probability he'll need 24 seven care and maybe get to a cognitive skills of a third or fourth grader. The critical thing at the moment is to get him through the night. If he lives the next 24 hours, we're good. I had the lowest possible score on the Glasgow coma scale. I had a three. I was not responding to pain, to sound, or to light. So after the doctor left, my wife, you know, grabbed me much as she's holding me here. And she leaned forward and she says, don't listen to them. She said, you know, if you want to go, I understand. Meaning if I want to die, that's fine. And she said, I'll miss you, but if you want to come back, we can do this. We can do this. And then she started repeating the words, you're strong, you're smart, you're capable. You're strong, you're smart, you're capable. Over and over and over and over. She did this throughout the night. At one point, she stopped to catch a breath. She was holding my hand and I, I gave her just a slight little, little pump like that. At that point, she knew I was there. She, I had heard her and I was coming back. So I, game on at that. She says, okay, let's do this. In preparing for my talks, I did some research. No one will ever say you know, what the odds were, but roughly that little white dot shows you the odds of recovering. One in a thousand, maybe even less. That was the one in a thousand based on my research was more just to be a you know, not needing 24 seven care, maybe cognitive skills of a third or fourth grader. It'd be much smaller to fully recover as I have. So what I wanna share with you today are the techniques I use to fully recover. My mantra became after I survived is, you know, let, let's help others live a better life. These are my first conscious thoughts. I wake up one morning and this is what I see. And our brains are interesting because they take the information that's coming in and they match it up with what's already there and create a story out of it to make sense. So the story I created was that I'm on a golfing trip in Utah with my brother-in-law and we're obviously in a very fancy hotel because every bed has its own mosquito netting. I was looking out the window, my neck was all messed up, so I had to roll over and I could see out the window and there was a tree there with some light shining up on it. And it wasn't a Colorado tree. I said, you know, hey, I, I lived here my whole life. I know Colorado trees and that's not one. So we're obviously in Utah on a golfing trip. I said, now how cool is this? And it's a five-star hotel. And here's a picture of my room. I'm like, oh man, we are living high in the hog. This is good living. Turns out I'm in the old posy bed at Craig Rehabilitation. And they zip you in these, I don't know if anyone else has, I don't mean to rehash old information, but once you've had a brain injury, they put you in this so that you don't accidentally fall out or get up because a lot of people don't have good balance. So this keeps you zipped in because another impact to the head could be fatal. And that's how I created my little story. And that began the adventure. Here's a picture of my little lady. I give her the bulk of the credit. She's the one that spent all that time there talking to me over and over, giving me my story. You're strong, you're smart, you're capable. She would come there. This was a 45 minute drive from where we lived to the hospital. 
take care of me during the day, talk to me, take me to therapies. And she'd leave later in the day, about dinner time, go back, take care of her store, do the paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. So that became our life for a few months. As I started recovering, the people at Craig said, okay, we've got to need the therapist. We got to get things, you know, get him back online. As I say, get my brain back online. So they give me a test to start with. Out of 60 items, and these are basic items, a fish, a tree, a cloud. Give me 60 of these and I got three correct. And this took the wind out of my wife's sail. She's like, whoa, I didn't realize it was that bad. I've always been a smart guy, you know, quick study, but uh, when she saw that, she's like, holy cow, it's worse than I thought. She never let me know this, but she knew we had some work to do. So I begin my rehabilitation. Coming out of my cocoon, as this is kind of the phase we called it, I had to start over. I had to relearn the basic skills how to use a knife and a fork, how to walk. I couldn't talk real well. I talked in more staccato. The words would, would come to me, but I couldn't enunciate them. And so my speech was more like this, very broken up, and I call it staccato. So I had to get my brain back online. I was very committed to this. I credit a lot of my survival to my early training at Coors. We were a small group. I call it the warrior training. There were like 10 of us. We were very loyal to the family. And our job was to improve the performance. So I had a lot of training on thinking differently, lateral thinking, being creative, uh, leadership training, et cetera, et cetera. I knew and understood the power of our minds and the story we tell ourselves. Also had some mentors outside of Coors that helped us. So now I'm in the phase of, you gotta reinvent yourself. This is what I wanna focus on today. That was background information. What I wanna share today is some tools and techniques for the people out there, because I realized you didn't have the training I had. You don't, you know, you didn't have that advantage going into it. And I've got a picture here of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, because I remember I used to joke about it. We're not in Kansas anymore. I remember her clicking her heels, talking to Toto, saying, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. So at least for me, after I had a brain injury, I had to relearn how to do pretty much everything. So I'll share with you what worked for me. Develop your vision. What is it you're going to do? What's your mantra? And take baby steps. Move slowly. Be patient. Use whatever's available around you to help you move forward with your eye on your vision. And always ask yourself, whatever is happening, how can this help me? How can I use this to my advantage? Step one, establish your vision. Again, from my project management days, what is it you are about? What's your mantra? And I can re remember this like it happened yesterday. I'm coming back from a meeting. This is at the Craig Rehab had a meeting with my doctors and therapists. And the doctor told me that my progress at that point had plateaued. It had been going up previously, but now it was flat. And he said, you know, don't worry. It, it, it won't go down, but it's just not improving as it used to. He goes, everyone's unique. Every situation's unique. We're not saying that it's over, but just it's where it is now. So as my wife and I are walking back to my room, and I had to hold on to the, they have railings along all the walls there because my balance wasn't the best. And I'm holding on to the railing, kind of shuffling along. And I stopped there and I tell her, I said, I'm not doing this. And she said, she said, you're not doing what? I said, I'm not going through life brain injured. I'm going to fully recover. And no one will ever know 
I had this accident. And she said, all right, let's do this. And that became my mantra. Fully recover, no one will ever know. So again, share with you what I did, what worked for me. That was my vision. So I suggest to you, come up with your vision. Make it uh, something you is personal to you, you have strong feelings about, and repeat it to yourself many times throughout the day. Write it down if necessary. And then here are some of the tactics I used to recover. As I said, I was a loan officer for a mortgage company, so I had some flexibility. Plus, I had come from a TBI, so they gave me even more flexibility. I learned quickly that my, I had the memory of, I used to say, I had a memory of a fly, maybe a few seconds. So I learned, you got to write stuff down. And I, there's power in writing things down because when you write it down, your mind is engaged in the writing. Physically, your hands holding the pen, you're writing that. And then afterwards you have the visual reminder. And so I learned to write down a little note, sometimes just a word. And I'd put it on our, our island in the kitchen that I would walk by several times during the day as a reminder, a, a little note. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I got it. So that was very useful. I then use mindfulness. Be very conscious of what you're doing. I remember, you know, to help recover, my wife said, you know, you take care of locking the doors at night. And so I'd, I would say yes. And then she said, did you lock the doors? To be honest, I couldn't remember, had no idea. So I started becoming very mindful. I would turn the lock, feel it, hear it click. Okay, I got it. I also learned that linking something you want to remember to a positive emotion helped me remember it much better. So if I want to remember someone's you know, name or that, I would link it to a smile or the lunch we were having, the moment. Very positive, very helpful to me. And I also remember, I want to share with you the words of Henry Ford. He said, whether you say you can or can't, either way, you're right. And I always like that. So our minds are incredibly powerful. So use that to your advantage. I would also reinforce old memories returning. We used to have a favorite vacation spot. My wife, for a while there before her store, worked for the airlines. We would go to San Diego several times a year, hang out at the beach there. And we went with some friends. And one time we were having a conversation and she goes, remember that time we were at the beach with you know, some friends? And I says, no, not a clue. I mean, I had nothing. And she says, oh yeah, come on, come on, you can remember this. You know, we were there, we hopped to the, the, the seawall, we were sitting there reading books and that. And the more she talked, I started getting little bits, little images. And I said, tell me more, tell me more, give me more. So as she started describing it better, it's like my brain was, was finding that spot where the, the memory was. And boom, once I had that connection, there was this download and instantly the memory memories were restored. And it was quite a rush. I, I, I used to get chills whenever it would happen. I'm happy to say it's very infrequent now because I think I've logged everything back in place, but it's a great way. So if that, if that happens to you, reinforce it, say, hey, yeah, everything's working. Things are coming back. I got this. Also, develop useful routines to make your life work. Again, for me, very short memory. So I quickly learned, put things in the same place. So I put my keys in my wallet, come inside the door, I had a little place, put everything there. That was it. You, you set everything in the same place. So I knew if it was missing, I knew where to go look for it. I didn't have to go hunt around the house. Same thing with your device or phone. You know, just I use a couple places now. It's either in my pocket or it's on my desk or it's in the kitchen counter there. JDI, this is the old Nike slogan, just do it. 
many times I was sitting on a couch and, that, and a thought would come to me of something I want to do, maybe not at that moment, but later. And I would tell myself, oh, you'll remember, you'll remember. And guess what? I didn't. So I learned through trial and error, mostly errors. When I have a thought like that, get up and do it. Either get up and take care of the situation or write it down. And in today's world with our devices, you know, typically right next to us, use some sort of note-taking app and just enter it so that you capture the thought. You don't have to worry about losing it. And it helps you lead a more normal life. Next was forgiveness and perseverance. As you move forward, you're going to forget things. Don't worry about it. Just say, hey, that's all right. I'll get it next time. I'm getting better and better and better. So what I forget something? Make a point. Yeah, I'll just pay more. I'll be more consciously aware, more mindful as I move forward. And then have the attitude of perseverance. Yeah, maybe I didn't get it this time, but I will ultimately get there. It's not a race. I don't have to do it by the end of the week, but I'll get there. So again, just be easy on yourself. Also, when I first got out for the first couple of years, I needed a nap. And again, I had some flexibility. I could eat lunch and that, and then somewhere about one or two o'clock, and I would describe it, it was a very unique experience. I wouldn't, it wasn't necessarily tired, but it felt like there was something between me and reality. I called it getting thick and I needed a nap. So I would lay down, set my alarm for like 30 minutes, instantly fall asleep. Our alarm would go off, you know, and I was fine. I just needed that 30 minutes I shut of sleep and then I was good for the rest of the day. I was also trained a lot in lateral thinking, which is creativity. And that lateral thinking to me helped me recover because it, it's looking at things in a different way. We were trained to say, how is this, how is this device like a couch? Okay, that, that forces you to start thinking differently. I would also, when I was riding my bike before my brain injury, I'd be out riding and I, I was a road biker. So signs and that I sometimes get bored. And so I, I developed this little game of reading signs backwards. So again, I believe that helped me recover because I had different neural connections. A lot of them deep stimul at speed limit backwards. Eat, eat fifth, eat fifth, 55. So I used to play that game with myself. So find ways of doing things a little differently to help you think better, think differently, get your brain back online. Increase your positivity. I've always been a pretty positive guy. And I learned the power of being positive. Again, back to Henry Ford, whether you say you can or you can't, either way you're right. So if you listen Check in to your self story periodically throughout the day. Is it positive or is it negative? If it's negative, change it. Take whatever negative thoughts you have and say, I used to think that, but I now think and then replace it. And then reinforce that new thought, that new positive thought over and over to where it becomes automatic. It becomes part of your story. Increase your resiliency. Again, was blessed ever since I was a little kid. Was taught, you know, something doesn't go your way. Find, you know, learn from the mistake and do things differently. Just pick yourself up and move on. So for me, that was, I would say, pretty much inbred from when I was a little shaver. But if you don't have that, that mindset, that skill, work on increasing yours. When something happens, maybe it didn't go exactly as you planned. That's okay. You moved forward and what, whatever it was that failed, learn from that 
and say, how can I do it differently moving forward to next time? Because as you know, as the, the old saying is, life is a, isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. So just keep moving forward. And again, reinforce your vision, your mission throughout the day. Say it over and over to yourself. This is what I'm going to do. I can't tell you how many times I would tell myself I'm going to fully recover and no one will ever know. I had the idea when I had that speech issue where I talked staccato. Talking to the doctors, they said, you know, that'll, that'll recover in time. And so to help myself along, I joined Toastmasters, where you have to get up in front of a group and you have to speak. And this, oh, I, the amount of help I got from that was incredible. Helped my confidence, helped my speaking ability, and got rid of the staccato. One of our mentors, this is, this is a biggie. What you focus on expands. So, so again, this is why I suggest, take your vision, your mantra, and focus on that. This lady that taught us this, my wife and I, hey, focus on, again, focus on the positive stuff because reality, what we see is what we're really thinking about. Not necessarily what's out there, but what we're thinking about. So start focusing on good stuff and then watch it expand in your life. My background's in engineering, so I'm a science guy and I like Einstein. So here's some summaries, a few basics. A, anything is possible. As Einstein says, it's all energy. You just, you match the energy and boom, you get it. You know, the, you got your own personal experience and you've got the, the, the law of attraction that's come along since then that reinforces this. Realize your power. You are a very powerful person. And you're always creating. And you're creating by your thoughts. The problem is most people are creating unconsciously. What they've been taught or what they've picked up over their life and that. So become more conscious of your thoughts, more conscious of your vision, of your mission, and what you want to create. And, and another way of saying this is every time you speak, you're placing an order. You're telling the universe reality, hey, this is, this is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. So you start telling yourself, I'm a piece of crap. Aye, aye, we can deliver that. We can make that come true. Or you say, hey, I love life. I can do this. I'm smart. I'm capable. And that'll come true too. Another reminder, hit it again. What you focus on expands. I was also blessed with mental toughness, again, from when I was a little kid. I want to remind everyone out there that you are inherently strong, powerful, and worthy. We are taught from a very young age to be weak and unsure. Parents, teachers, people we meet on the street, whatever. That's, that's the common thought. So change that. Also, social media. Recent study showed that uh, about two thirds of everything on social media is negative because they're selling something and they give people in their weak point. So again, be careful what you're uh, feeding yourself. The story of two wolves, that's a reminder to me. I had it, but it was too small for, uh, for a slide here, but a Cherokee was teaching his grandson about life and he said there's there's the good wolf and the bad wolf and the good wolf is about generosity and love and talent and security and the bad wolf is about scarcity and fear and weakness and the grandkid goes well who wins and the cherokee grandfather says the one you feed so be careful of the wolf you are feeding. Be aware of the wolf you are feeding and feed yourself and this wolf good stuff. Mental toughness, I put here, warriors don't have this issue. Again, back to my training, small group, we were the little warriors. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Joan of Arc, all these people had their mission. 
They believed in themselves. They believed in their worthiness. So I want you to develop your own mission, believe in it, trust in it, and move forward. Also, release that which no longer serves you. As we go through life, we pick up stuff. And it may be useful at that time, but it is no longer useful. Feel free to get rid of it. Lighten your load and use the stuff that's good and works. Be confident. Expect success. Focus on the what. Your job is just to say, here's what I want to create. Don't worry about the details. They'll happen. Assume success, and then look for, look for unexpected support. Again, my mentor had the saying, the universe says yes. Our job is to say, here's what I want. The universe goes, okay, here we got that. And the universe doesn't care. Loves us all the same way. You say, I want a, a crappy life, you got it. You say, I want a great life, you got it. So again, you're in charge. Be mindful, create a great story, create a great vision, and move forward. Some tenets for being the best you. Be impeccable and authentic. Just be you. Impeccable is when you walk your talk. You say what you mean, you mean what you say. Assume 100% responsibility for everything in your life. Everything. It's a choice you made. Live with it. What you focus on expands. Utilize lateral thinking. And then love yourself. Even when you have those bad days, love yourself. Say, hey. Yeah, I can do better. We can do it. We're good. Assume full responsibility for everything in your life. Again, if you don't like something, change it. And it all starts with your thoughts up here. A reminder, be authentic. People are always watching. They're judging. They're saying, hey, is this person? Here's, here's what they say. And here's what they do. When the two coincide, that's where power is. So be one of those people that do what they say. Most of the time, our limitations are self-imposed. So I would ask you, how is it that you are clipping your own wings? What is preventing you from soaring? and then start working on those items that pop up and they will change over time. As always, there's a secret ingredient, the secret sauce, the old family recipe. I'll share with you what this is, uh, the secret ingredient to all of this. And it's all about you. You're in charge. It's your show, it's your road trip. You decide what you want to create. Some starting points. I believe in me. I love me. Start repeating this. If necessary, keep this to your mirror. Someplace where you see it many times throughout the day and start building up that uh, self-love, that self-esteem so that you know how awesome you are. So success is all about moving forward. And yes, you're going to stumble. That's just part of you know, life here on planet Earth. Some people call it a failure. I just call it, okay, so I learned something. And you move forward until you achieve what you set out to achieve, your success. And one takeaway I would ask you to leave this little talk with is what you focus on expands. Just remember that. And when you catch yourself, maybe going down a path you don't want to go, just stop, say, okay, that's the old story. I'm going to create a new story. And then reinforce your new story. This afternoon, I would suggest to you, take a few minutes, write down, what are you going to focus on? It'll be different for each of you, but that's fine. What are you going to focus on? And then craft your new story. What's your new story? How are you going to define yourself moving forward? Close up here. We've got some books my wife wrote. Secrets to Reduce Your Medical Debt. And this may come as a shocker to you, but when we got out of the hospital, we had a mountain of debt. 
she came up with some tactics that helped us lower that significantly. Some pointers in there. Luke was our golden retriever. We learned a lot from him, so we put a little book together, Luke's Life Lessons. And then the Cocoon Chronicles. When I was in the hospital in a Craig, visitors were limited because of the, they didn't want the mental stimulation to tax me. So people would want to want to know what's going on. So my wife would come and spend time with me during the day, and then she'd go home at night and send out an email, hey, here's what's going on, here's what happened today, blah, blah, blah. So later on, a friend says, you know, that is, that's, there's some good stuff there. It's uplifting in that. Got to make a book out of it. And so she did. She took those emails and created uh, the Cocoon Chronicles. So if you're interested in that, it's on Amazon. Check it out. And that is it. Thank you so much, Glenn, for, for a wonderful presentation. Um, at this time, we're going to open it up for questions for Glenn. Um, there's a few ways that you can ask questions. Um, first, you can use the raise your hand feature. So to do this, you want to click on the participants button on the bottom of the page. When that opens, there'll be a raise your hand button you can press, and one of us will call on you to ask your question. Um, second, if you don't want to ask the question yourself, you can just type your question in the chat, um, and one of us or Glenn will, will read the question um, and answer the question. So now we'll open it up um, for anyone who might have questions for Glenn. Oh, Erica, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead. Glenn, thank you for a really inspiring talk. I think this is... Um, it's really a testament to how you've been able to be a, a pillar of the TBI community and you know, show what recovery can really look like. But I, I was wondering, as you were going through, how did your social circle respond? And were there people who may have been a, maybe more negative or cautious than you had wanted to be? And how did you address that? Not surprisingly, there were some that were negative. Again, I go back to early on, my wife, she was the filter. She would say, hey, look, we're in this phase now. And we're not going to, you know, what was what happened before happened before. So we're taking that and kind of starting over. So here's kind of the ground rules. You come into the house. Here's what I do. You're not, you know, no bitching and moaning. We're just talking about the good stuff, uh, how he's doing, how he's improved, that sort of thing. And it was, it was very well received. Everyone, everyone honored it. Everyone was glad to get on board and help. So it was, it was very good. Anyone else have a question for Glenn? Should I just read it? No, oh, sorry, we're not being we're not able to make the hand thing go up. It's our, oh, uh, go, our go right ahead. <laughs> so if you if you don't if we can just ask. Yeah, go ahead. Glenn, did you have uh, how much physical uh, 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 your limitations after the after the accident, physical wise? Uh, this all apply. It seems like this would apply to both both physical and mental, but. Was there a correlation between the physical and the um, and these these tips that you give that that particularly uh, address some of your physical um, uh, things you had to had to recoup? I I don't remember taking medication. I'm sure they they gave me some. Like I said, in the first ten days, I'm totally out of it. You know, just kind of floating around in la la land. But uh, when I came home, I wasn't on anything. I had, as you saw, my, my right shoulder and neck were, were kind of messed up. And so they had a, a therapist, a chiropractor of sorts at Craig Rehab. And they would come in a couple times a week and give me an adjustment here and there. And then when I went, 
on, when I was an outpatient, I went, found another one, went one that was closer to home and did that. I also had uh, diplopia. I don't know if you're familiar with that, double vision. What I would see was kind of skewed. So I would get two images that would cross. And for a while there, they gave me some um, mirrored glasses and they, it, they were a pain in the butt. I mean, I, they didn't do anything for me. I just let it go. And what I found as I started recovering, if I looked down out of the top of my eyes, everything was fine. But if I looked out of the bottom of my eyes, things would cross. That gradually improved. So what I would do, especially early on, I would walk around kind of like this, looking out of the top of my eyes. And people thought, I'm sure I was, I was a little weird in that, but it got better over time. And you get, you get used to it. So it was, it was really no big deal. Um, there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see that. It says, um, were you in a coma when you squeezed your wife's hand? Uh, could you hear her? And how old were you when your accident happened? I had just turned 50. And yes, I was in the coma when I squeezed her hand. I don't remember any of that. I just, she told me the story later on. She said, you were just there. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm not responding to the opening my eyes and shining the light in, nothing. The pupils aren't dilating. I don't respond to sound. And they, they, they on the pain thing, they take like a sharp, pen pen i guess and drag it along the bottom of your foot there was no response to that so i got a, a, a poor rating for that so i'm basically like i said all i was doing was breathing i couldn't swallow and yeah and she said and all that after she talked that time i gave her a fist pump Um, I actually had a question, Glenn, you had mentioned going to Toastmasters to, to help you with your speaking. So I was kind of wondering that at what point, like how long into your recovery you did that and, and where did you get that idea? <laughs> I, let's see, I got to think back now. I joined Toastmasters. Okay, so my accident happened, uh, or as I call it, my event happened in 04 and it was probably around 2010 when I joined Toastmasters. And I heard- so six, six years after your injury. Correct. Yeah. And a friend told me they were over there, we were having lunch and he said, you know, have you considered Toastmasters? Because my, my staccato talk was still happening but not as pronounced and he said, I said, no, at that point in time, I was looking for what do I want to do next in my life? And he, everyone would tell me, look, you got a great story. You've survived well, you can help other people live a better life. So I thought, well, okay, I'll do that. That sounds fun. And so that's when I started transitioning from being, you know, an engineer and then a loan officer to being a speaker to help people uh, realize their power. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, did you receive vestibular therapy? Did you suffer any dizziness and, uh, and any permanent deficits? No dizziness, never had any dizziness. They were, in fact, they, they were surprised. They talked about that at Craig, that my balance was always real good. Uh, no dizziness. The only thing I had uh, again was that that diplopia, the, the the cross vision, and it's at first it 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 bothered me a lot because I would lay in bed at night and you look up and you see a couple couple lights and you know there's only one and it, it took a while to get used to and that you know we did like I said we did those special glasses and that and this was a, a vision therapist that had years of experience worked with Craig and no, nothing really worked it was just over time that it got better and I, I think it was a matter of it got better I got used to it and 
And then like, again, my, my thoughts just, Hey, I'm going to fully recover. Like I said, it's still there a little bit, but not anything like it was at first. Um, there's another question. Did you receive functional rehabilitation or anything related to Western medicine while at Craig or, or even after Craig? Not, well, I, I would say yes, the traditional stuff, the, you know, the Western medicine, I'm sure they did all that. I mean, the, the people at, at Craig were, were awesome. One of the guys that was, uh, I guess uh, my caseworker, I guess, I remember his name was Bob and he was in a wheelchair. He had been through some things. He was now in a wheelchair and now volunteered at Craig. And I mean, he was a super guy and he would just help you. They had been through this and they would help my wife and I know kind of what's coming down the pike, know what to expect. Uh, he would check in on us periodically. Hey, tomorrow you got this and that. And they were always very good about reminding you what appointments you had because everyone knows you've got a crappy memory. So they would write things out in nice big letters for you. But yeah, I'd say pretty traditional. And, and again, I went back to the, the chiropractic thing. My neck was tight and kind of banged up. But once they got that all straightened out, I mean, it's been fine. Um, we have another question. Uh, how do you stay positive when you have no one to be a cheerleader for you? I mean, you, you've spoken a lot about how, you know, your wife has really uh, been so positive and helping sort of, you know, spirit this. But if you, if you don't have someone like your wife in your life to be a cheerleader for you, um, how would you stay positive? I was, I was always positive even before. Like I said, from when I was a little shaver, mom just raised us to be positive people and when i was in the in my coma brenda took over for that telling me the positive stories and i just when i as my brain started coming back online it became a natural process of you know you can do this i mean still to this day many times during the day i'm just saying hey i'm glad to be me i'm glad i can do what i can do i i had just started golfing right before i got hurt Prior to that, I always thought it was like watching paint dry, but a friend got me, he says, hey, come on, let's go, let's go do some golfing. So I started doing that, enjoyed it. And then shortly thereafter had my, you know, event and then picked that up later. And my goal was to, I mean, my, my for anyone that doesn't golf, they, they, they rate you on your index. That's how many, how well you're shooting that day at that course. And mine was normally, uh, I guess, an, an average American male golfer, about an 18 which means I would shoot one over par for 18 holes. And then after my injury, it shot way up to like 30, 35 and that. And so then again, when I said I was gonna fully recover, my goal was to get my, my index back down or better than it was. And I'm happy to say I've done that. It wasn't an 18 something, now it's a 16 something. My goal is to get it to single digits. So it sounds like you were setting some some personal goals for yourself, even like even if, so if even if you didn't have a cheerleader, you know, like your wife, you were able to see something that you wanted and set a personal goal. Correct. I always you know, I've always had a strong sense of self, you know, self love, self worth. Again, credit back to mom. Mom's always letting us know, hey, don't don't. I remember her saying, if everyone took poison, would you? And so it's like, yeah, that was kind of the joke at the dinner table, mom, mom, there was a lot of poison going around today, but I didn't take any, but that was, that was just the way we were all raised. So it was, it was, it's not like something I, I came upon. It was just something I was, I knew. And again, and credit, credit mom for giving us that as we started out. I would like to share with you, you people out there, don't lose hope. The process is, well, again, I'm speaking from my, my process, my experience. I don't know about everyone else's, but it can take longer than you think or expect. Be patient and just know each day you're getting better, you're improving and take that and, and just make it again, make that part of your, your mantra, make that part of your, your self story. I'm improving today. I'm getting better. I'm getting stronger. I'm wiser and I'm going to achieve my goal. And just again, 
Just don't give up hope. Just keep moving forward and take the next step. Okay. Um, there's actually one more question that just popped up in the chat. Okay. Uh, do you still have times where you grieve what was lost? No. I, I will expand upon that. I don't, <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't grieve upon what was lost. Again, part, part of my, my training, my reading, this is outside of course, just my personal philosophy. The books I was reading, the beliefs I had is that, you know, we live in a dynamic universe. Life goes on. And you learn to, you know, if, if, if you lose something, I can remember in the old days, I'd lose something, you know, and maybe look for it for a little bit. And if it's not there, like, okay. As, again, that mentor I was telling you about that taught us that what you focus on expands. She also had, had the, the thought that this or something better. And so I like that. My wife and I picked that up. So if you lose something and you can't find it, you're like, okay, it's gone. I did my due diligence. I looked for it. So if it's gone, so this or, hey, something better must be coming. And that became kind of my loss. So, yeah, I don't, I don't have regrets. Um, so, again, we want to thank you for your presentation um, and thank you um, all for attending. Um, if anyone wants to contact Glenn um, after this, his, uh, you can go to glennbot.com. You could see some of his other presentations and links to um, the books that he referred to, uh, as well as his email if anyone wants to contact him. Uh, so immediately after this presentation, there's gonna be a survey uh, for you to answer about today's presentation. Um, so that will pop up um, after this. Um, also, we'll be following up with an email survey if you happen to step off and, and are unable to complete the survey now. Um, also, everyone be on a lookout for the new edition of our newsletter, which is going to be coming out soon, TBI News and Views. Um, and we'll also be having some information on our winter brain, um, which is going to be on January 10th at 12 p.m. Uh, Kelsey Boyer, who's the founder of Save a Brain Foundation, she'll be speaking about the TBI she sustained while snowboarding. And again, if you're interested in any more of our events or participating in our research, um, much of which can done, be done remotely these days, um, please check us out um, on the Kessler Foundation website. So again, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we all really enjoyed your talk and we appreciate um, your time and, and you know, look forward to um, hearing from you in the future.